Welcome back. Today we'll conclude our exploration of Europe from 1500 to 1800 with a look at the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. Typically, discussions of the scientific revolution begin with Copernicus, the Polish mathematician and astronomer credited with the development of heliocentric theory, the notion that the sun, rather than the earth, is in the center of the cosmos. Heliocentrism replaced the long-held view, known as geocentrism, that the earth is the stationary center of the universe with everything else in the heavens revolving around it. Geocentrism is also known as the Ptolemaic system after the second century Greco-Egyptian who is most frequently associated with it. Copernicus did not use telescopic observations as the basis for his discovery. Rather, extrapolating from his mathematical calculations, he found that when he switched the positions of the Earth and the Sun, his predictions for the movement of the planets and stars were far more accurate and far simpler. The mathematical elegance of heliocentrism became obvious in his central work entitled On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, published in the year of his death, 1543. It's important to note that, at this point, heliocentrism was appreciated principally as an interpretive mathematical assumption that improved astrophysical calculations. Few thought that it really described the nature of the cosmos. However, when an Italian astronomer and physicist, Galileo, published his telescopic observations of lunar and planetary movements in 1609, Copernicus's heliocentric hypothesis was confirmed. The Earth revolved around the Sun and not vice versa. Galileo's findings unleashed a torrent of condemnation, most of it from the Catholic Church, then in the midst of consolidating the changes to its ideology and dogma that arose from the Council of Trent, which concluded in 1563. A major doctrine confirmed by the Council was geocentrism. Now, while it may not seem like geocentrism has anything to do with theology, the idea of the Earth as a center of creation was a very important one for the Catholic Church. In fact, the entire Christian narrative of God so loving the world that he sent his only begotten Son, the notion that Jesus is the incarnation of God with the mission of universal salvation, these ideas in fact require that the earth be the center of creation. Why would God place the crown of his creation, the earth, anywhere else than the center of the universe? To be placed elsewhere would belittle Christ's sacrifice and demean God's judgment. Copernicus had been clever enough to avoid this consequence of heliocentrism by treating the theory as a mere mathematical hypothesis, not Galileo, who seems to have relished confrontation. Although he was not interested in challenging the Catholic Church per se, he would not be turned away from the exploration of nature, and his observations convinced him that the testimony of his telescope could not be denied by any reasonable person. But when he made his challenge public, it was in fact a challenge to the church, and he was accused and convicted of suspicion of heresy and forced to recant and was sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his days. He died in Tuscany in 1642. Beyond being the most important astronomer, engineer, and, yes, I'll say it, thinker of the early 17th century, Galileo bequeathed to us a fundamental assumption of modern physics, that the laws of nature are mathematically describable. Here's what he wrote in 1623. This grand book, the universe, is written in the language of mathematics. These words provide a transition to another titan, of the scientific revolution, the Englishman Isaac Newton, perhaps the most mathematically gifted genius of the 17th century. Newton liked to say that he stood on the shoulders of giants, meaning that the work he did would not have been possible without the brilliance of his predecessors, such as Galileo. He was being unnecessarily modest. Newton's achievement was to mathematize the laws of physics and to demonstrate their applicability through calculus, a branch of mathematics that he co-discovered 
and that continues to strike fear in the hearts of undergraduates to this day. Through his calculations, Newton was able to demonstrate that the physical universe obeys universal laws. There's an important consequence to this achievement. Specifically, the realization that human reason has the ability to unlock the secrets of nature. While Newton himself was too reserved to make this claim, he was deeply religious. His successors believed he had demonstrated that human reason is a corollary to divine revelation. In the 17th century, such an idea was revolutionary. Newton's impact, particularly after his death when his works had been translated and popularized, was a symbol of the power of human reason, a notion which became a cornerstone of the Age of Enlightenment that followed in the 18th century. Let's sum up what we've covered in these lectures on the religious, political, economic, and scientific changes that remade the European world between 1500 and 1800. What are the unique factors that occasioned the rise of Europe? First, the states emerging in Europe, particularly in the North and the West, are internally competitive and outwardly aggressive. They're competing with each other, and much of that competition brings about the exploration of distant parts of the world. Their competition ignites wars of religion, wars of territorial possession, and wars of commerce. Tragically, these conflicts often lead to the subjugation of the indigenous populations of non-European civilizations. There's another unique factor that characterizes the nations of Europe during this period, namely a commitment to new scientific discoveries, and this is very much the legacy of the scientific revolution brought about by Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton. It begins with the conviction that knowledge about nature is important for its own sake, and ends with the realization that such knowledge can also yield powerful instruments, not only for understanding, but for conquest. Europe's outward reach to Asia, to Africa, and to the Americas was a consequence of these factors. We see it beginning in the years between 1500 and 1800, and we'll see it continue in profound ways in the 19th and 20th centuries. Until then, best wishes.